Okay, well, Salaamu Alaikum, everyone. Um, we have been just dealing with technology issues. Um, so I, I always take that as a very positive sign that this is going to be an incredible halakha tonight. Um, that's usually when we have all kinds of what we call devil attacks and technology just you know goes haywire for no reason. Um, but so alhamdulillah for that. Um, so sorry to keep you waiting. Um, so I'm going to keep my, my comments very short. Um, I um, continue to get emails from people who say that you know, they're very excited about what we're doing. They are heritage Muslims. Um, they feel um, that they really want to reconnect with God and they don't know where to start. And it's the same theme from a lot of people from a lot of different places, male, female, um, all age groups. Um, and so I just, I mean, I've said in the past, I think it's very important to start, in my opinion, again, like I think my answer might be quite different than what the professor would say, but. Um, from the perspective of a convert, I, I would um, advise people to just start by talking to God and starting that conversation. So you have in your mind that God is, you know, someone you want to befriend, someone that you feel um, you want to develop an intimate relationship with, because, you know, we know from our faith that God sees everything and knows everything, so you are completely transparent to God, I mean, we covered that in, in one of the surahs, um, but, you know, I think just to, to state the intention, you know, God knows, um, especially if you come, I think, to find the Project Illumin Halakas, I always believe that because what we're doing is so unusual and quite vilified by a lot of people, um, if you found it and you found something that touches your heart, that that is an opportunity that God is giving you to hear something different. And, um, and I also tell people, you know, when you start the conversation with God, to start paying attention to the signs. Um, because I believe that God sends people signs in all different kinds of ways. And they're very personal. And they could be um, a feeling, they could be something that you see in your day that um, has some kind of synchronicity to something you've been thinking about or, um, you know, praying about or dreaming about. Um, I think when you start opening your senses to the different ways that God can send you, um, you know, feelings, messages, inspirations, that that's very powerful. Um, but more importantly, um, you know, this, this act of conversion, especially if you're a heritage Muslim, and in many ways you're kind of going against the grain of what you have been taught um, or what is familiar to you, I think it takes a lot of courage and a lot of bravery um, to prepare yourself to know that this is going to be a lonely journey. Um, and it's okay because really the only ones that matter on this journey, your personal journey, are you and God. And that's really it. Um, and it doesn't matter if anyone else agrees or recognizes what you're doing or um, you know, and I think that it's always nice on this convert journey. I mean, you know, in my journey, you, you just by um, definition, you end up not really talking to anybody because you, you figure out very quickly that nobody understands the path that you're going on. No one has the same kinds of issues, questions, problems, um, you know, anxieties. Um, and so by definition, it is already a very lonely path. But when you invite God on that path, you don't really need anyone else, um, but it's still a very unusual feeling, you know, to feel like it's just kind of you, um, and I and that's okay. That's part of the challenge, and I think that's part of the um, the test. Um, and also to prepare yourself mentally that, you know, like when I when I started on this journey, I felt a sense of um, self dislike. We've talked about that in some of the suras where you just don't feel comfortable in your own skin. Um, or you might feel worse at times where you really hate yourself or you don't like the things that you've done. Um, and But all I knew is that I wanted God and I wanted this journey. Like that's all I knew. That was the only certainty in my life is that I didn't like anything else that was happening. But the one thing I knew is I wanted the path of God, whatever that looked like. I had no idea what that looked like. I had no idea what to expect. But all I knew is that's what I wanted. I wanted something that was beautiful and light. I mean, I couldn't even articulate, but I just didn't want what I had. I didn't want my life the way it was. Um, and so what comes with that is, I think, um, a bit of fear, 
because you're kind of treading into the unknown. You have no idea what is going to come your way or how you should respond to it. And you know, some, some days I felt like I didn't even know, like, okay, I didn't even know where to put my hands, right? I, like everything just felt so out of place. And so that requires a lot of patience and a lot of trust that um, when you tell God, I want this path and I want you, um, and please God help me, that it's going to feel very uncomfortable. Aside from lonely, it's going to be uncomfortable. <laughs> and it's going to feel like you're completely lost. And I think that's okay. And it's again, very unsettling. Um, but when you start opening yourself to signs and seeing like, okay, oh my gosh, you know, maybe this is really the right path for me. Um, and I can't articulate what it is because it's different for everybody, I'm sure. Um, but you know when you see something and it's like, not like anything else. It's, it's a divine sign. And I think people get, up, get these things all the time and they usually wave them away. But when you're looking for the path of God and you start putting your antenna up, you'll recognize it and you'll know it. No one, no one will have to tell you. But there's a bit of, um, besides the loneliness, the patience, the courage, um, there has to be some humility too. You have to tell yourself, you know what, I've done everything according to what I thought was right, what felt good to me, what made sense to me. And you know what, maybe that's exactly the problem, is that you, fought, you know, fell into whatever it was that you were raised with, whatever you felt comfortable with, and especially on the road of a convert, you, you know, are potentially going to have to change literally everything about the way you understand the world. And we've talked about that here too in some of the surahs. It's like everything that you place your comfort in, your sense of familiarity in, your trust in, in this world is up for questioning and could potentially change if you want the path of the divine. And I think just to be aware of that and allow yourself the fear, because it does come with a lot of fear and uncertainty, and that's where it comes, you know, the, the test of patience and perseverance comes in. But if you feel like, no, I know I want the path of God, I 100% guarantee you, you know, God hears you and knows that's what you want. And God may put you through some of the paces to see, okay, you said that's what you want, how badly do you want it? How long are you willing to talk to me at night and feel like I'm not responding to you? Are you gonna give up because you didn't get your answer in your time frame? Um, and so just to, um, you know, it's not an easy journey, but there's no other journey. And for me, like understanding what the alternative was, was not, it was not gonna cut it. It was like either I want the path of light or everything else is darkness. And the, between the two, there's, there's no choice. There's no comparison. So just to say, you know, having been on that journey, just stay with it. Um, it's okay that you're uncomfortable. It's okay that it's unfamiliar. It's okay that it's not on your time frame. I think these are all sort of signs and indications that, you know, you're ready. It's like a preparation for this journey. And to let go of, um, you know, your expectation that you know what is necessarily, that what that path is going to look like. Um, and, um, and just keep focusing on that conversation with God. And I really believe that if you stay the course, you know, God will guide you and, and answer your prayers in exactly the way they need to be answered. And that often is not what you expect or um, think it's gonna look like but it's better than anything you can anticipate. So, and these, these halakas, the Project Illumin halakas especially, are so valuable for recognizing all the things that you, that, that you see in this life. And I think it, they give you so much insight into um, what is necessary to take this path. So learning, there's nothing that can replace the value of learning and knowledge to fill the void that's going to come with the loneliness and the fear. That's really the, the medicine for that. So, alhamdulillah, I'm looking forward to an incredible halakha, inshallah. So, thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah lahu alhamdulillah wa ala kulli shayu qareer. ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله ولا نعبد إلا إياه له النعمة له الفضل له الثناء الحسن
لا اله الا الله مخلصين له الدين ونصلي ونسلم ونبارك على محمد وعلى اله واصحابه وتبعوا باحسان الى يوم الدين وشكرا للسلام ورحمه الله Inshallah tonight we'll talk about Surah Al-Najm, Surah number 53. Um, a, um, This surah, inshallah, as we will see, is um, I don't know how to describe it. Um, monumental in its uh, meaning and its transformative impact. Uh, Surah Al-Najm um, there is an initial issue that most the clear majority I mean the, the overwhelming majority say that Surah Al-Najm is a Meccan Surah uh, and that's fairly clear there are a couple of reports from couple from a few sources that say it's Medina that it was revealed in Medina but the, 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 these are not reliable and um, I don't know too many people that have given much weight to that claim so it's quite clear that it was revealed in Mecca but what is less clear is when precisely was it revealed in Mecca? There are a large number of reports that say that Surah Al-Najm was revealed after Surah Al-Ikhlas. Um, and if so, because of course Surah Al-Ikhlas is the foundational Surah uh, which is the it, and if that is so that it was revealed after Surah Al-Ikhlas so that would mean that it was around in order of revelation around number 20 or so which would mean that it's an early Meccan surah the problem however is twofold one is that we have reports that say that surah al-najm was revealed in the fifth year of uh, the prophecy of the Dawah uh, in Mecca and if it is in the fifth year then it would be a mid Meccan surah not an early Meccan surah but there is another challenge and that Surah Al-Najm as we will see inshallah from the substance of the surah seems to be talking about the Isra and the Mi'raj. And if indeed it is talking about the Isra and the Mi'raj, or at least in part talking about the Isra and Mi'raj, then it cannot be an early Meccan surah. Um, The Isra and Mi'raj did not take place till near the late Meccan period. Um, I mean, you, you could say early late or late middle 
uh, but definitely not in uh, the first half and not in right in the middle of the Meccan period. So we, we do have this challenge of conflicting reports about when it was revealed and reports that contextually would tell us that it had to be uh, post Isra al Maraj or around the Isra al Maraj. As we will see, we have another claimed historical event uh, that Surat al Najm dovetails with. Uh, and these are the the uh, uh, the um, what is often known as the satanic verses incident, or in in English, there in the Western world, they're often referred to as the satanic verses incident. In Islamic sources, they're known as the al gharaniq or hadith al gharaniq and the satanic versus incident or hadith al gharaniq if it took place, it would be mid Medina period. That would be consistent with the 5th century Hijra. Um, but it would not be consistent with the, the surah itself addressing the Isra al Maraj because that purportedly took place before the Isra al Maraj. So, how do we resolve this issue and does it make a difference? Well, as we'll see, it, it does make a difference. That's the first point is that it does make a difference when we. Um, when we can pin down the time of revelation because of what the surah tells Muslims and what it, the, the type of message, the type of lesson it communicates to Muslims. But how do we resolve this? Well, First, I think it is highly unlikely that it was revealed after Al-Ikhlas. It is highly unlikely that the order of revelation is in fact around 20 or so. And it is also highly unlikely that this surah um, was revealed uh, around Fifth, uh, fifth, the fifth year Hijra. It is far more likely that, in fact, it was revealed after Al Isra al Maraj, which would make it right at the beginning of the late Meccan period. So, in other words, the the last couple of years before the Hijra. And it was clearly. putting down a line of demarcation for Muslims who are willing to make the type of transformation that Surat al-Najm is talking about. Muslims who are going to accept the moral demands of Surat al-Najm and Muslims who were going to part way. With, uh, with the past. Um, and as Surat al Najm makes quite clear, uh, the, the type of transformation that Surat al Najm was, re was requiring was that before there is a physical migration of any sort, that there would be an internal spiritual migration. And that the physical migration 
itself will turn out to be pointless unless the, it is preceded by an internal transformation and an internal migration. In my view, Surat al-Najm goes even beyond that and is say that it is a a, a surah about the liberation of the self from its delusions, from its falsehoods, from its various attachments uh, to a different reality and a different way of seeing existence. At the beginning, I want to, before we delve into the surah, I want to um, explain a concept uh, that, um, again, as we often find, uh, is not um, is not common or is not uh, popular, uh, familiar. It's not familiar in our contemporary age to a lot of Muslims. But the, those who, especially those who read in Sufi-esque literatures, uh, would be quite familiar with it. And that Muslim scholars often talked about the world in which we live in, live in that at the individual level and at the collective level, People either exist in the world of Ashbah, in the world of Ashbah means in the world of shadows. Um, uh, Ashbah could also mean the world of ghosts, but they meant by it the world of mere reflections, um, world of uh, superficial reality. Uh, versus the world of arwah, alam al-ajbah and alam al-arwah. Alam al-arwah, uh, the world of true souls. And simplifying this discourse somewhat, uh, say that they would, we are born with the potentiality of realizing the full meaning of our soul, which is divine, and of, reali of realizing the embracing that, divil that, that divinity, embodying this divinity, in fact, becoming the manifest, uh, the manifestation of divine attributes But that through existence, our potentiality, our divine potentiality, remain just that, just a potentiality. But that the vast majority of human beings, what they end up doing is that they end up dealing with the world in simple reactive modes. So, in fact, what they exhibit in life is as if shadows of the divine potentiality. So, if you imagine whoever you are, you know, Khalid, there's the divine potentiality of Khalid, and that's the real pristine Khalid that Allah has created. But Khaled then is born in this world, knows hunger, knows cold, knows needs, deals with desires, with irritations, with annoyances, with um, uh, whatever stimulation there is. And 
if Khaled never goes back and reclaims the true divide, the potentiality that God created, then all that is exhibited are like mere shadows of that original creation. And they would often talk about in the, in the world in which we exist that because Alam al-Ajbah, the, the world of shadows, is a, is a scary world. It is a world in which the light of the divine um, it manifests, um, occasionally manifests, but is very quickly extinguished um, if it is not nourished. And the world of the shadows are very much threatened by the light. And so if um, it's like a horror movie in a sense, in a way, uh, you know, you, you have a, a world of shadows and, and, and um, uh, specters. And if there is a light that shines any, anywhere, they, they recoil from that light unless they undergo transformation, to know in fact that this is not something threatening, but this is a true expression of what they themselves can be. And so in, in this type of literature, a lot of the evils of the world are explained, including a lot of poverty, a lot of cruelty, a lot of immorality, a lot of um, pain, a lot of suffering, is ex explained as the dominance of the world of shadows in existence. That the more human beings, at first individually, but then collectively, are able to reclaim the divine essence, um, in, in one of my publications, I called it manifest godliness in, instead of godlessness, but it's the same concept. Um, the world of shadows is a world of smoke and mirrors. It's a world of impulses. It's a world of betrayal. It's a world of envy, it's a world of egos, it's a world of insecurity, it's a world in which people are constantly at each other's throats. Um, now, of course, after that, you you know, some scholars in, are very pessimistic, and they think that only a very small minority uh, will ever move from the world of Ashbah to the world of Arwah, Alam al-Arwah, and that the fate of the world will be primarily that it lives in the world of shadows. Um, and while other scholars, like for instance, Sheikh, uh, uh, Imam Ghazali, when he wrote Ahiyya Alum al-Din, he wrote Ahiyya Alum al-Din because he believed that, in fact, it is possible to convince a a subst substantial number of people to transform from the world of Ashbah to the world of Arwah. Now, why do I explain this? It's because I say it will be useful for us to understand Surah al -Najm if we keep this concept in mind, and I'll come back to it. Um, because Surah al najm was one of the surah that inspired this entire discourse about the world of shadows and the world of souls, and the reality in which human beings dwell, and to what extent are they successful in being true viceroys, true agents of the divine, Khulafa'ullah, because that's a very heavy charge. It's, it's a very heavy responsibility. The, 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 um, 
you know, if some, if if you think of being a Khalifa, representing human beings as a serious responsibility, well, just think of just being a Khalifa of God. The, that you, as an individual, you are Allah's Khalifa, and that you are representing the divine on this earth. Um, And so it's, this is a, 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 a very big part of the Islamic tradition that, again, it's unfortunate that in modernity we find so many Muslims, you know, there are plenty of Muslims in the modern age that will live and die and will never even be exposed to this material anymore. Okay, so Surah Al Najm then starts literally as if constructing a painting, or perhaps in our modern age, would say as if uh, turning on a virtual reality movie. And it presents you with a series of a series of um, images one after the other that will be abruptly, abruptly changed, the tone will, and the subject will abruptly change, as we will see. So when Najm is a Hawa, so it starts out with a star. It doesn't tell you what star. It's not in the plural, it's not about stars but a star and it doesn't explain the star and is a hawa is not as it sets nor necessarily as it descends so it's not a soft image of a star that is setting or a star that is descending but hawa if you want a literal translation, it would be the star as it falls. And it starts with this conjunctive article where, and, and the stars when it falls. So it grabs your attention. What star, what about the star falling? And especially that for the audience of the Quran and throughout of human history, it's not just the Arabs, but throughout, um, a falling star was often taken as a sign of omen and a sign of bad things to come. Um, A shooting star is, is, is somewhat different from a falling star because a, a shooting star is one that comes and goes, but a falling star is a star that is going to disappear or so it appears from the heavens. So it's a strange oath. Allah is swearing by the fall of the star or a falling star a descending star without explanation as to what star but as we will see this is immediately coupled with something that seems to be a juxtaposition of a falling star so, by the star, when it falls, 
صاحبكم ما ضل صاحبكم وما غوى Who's your companion? Who's your friend? This is a reference to the Prophet ﷺ. And in Arabic, if you say to someone, Sahbak or Sahibak, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's your friend. But it means that this is someone that you know. So, um, it, 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 the word Sahib has a dual meaning depending on the context. It could mean a friend, an actual friend, or an actual companion, but it also could mean someone that is not a friend, but is just someone that you know well, or you ought to know well. So, your friend, your companion, i.e. Muhammad والسلام, has not strayed nor erred. Nor nor does he speak out of caprice or out of whim. Hawa is capriciousness or whimsy and so you're saying it's like saying you know you know that this is a man you know this man and you know that this man doesn't just shoot his mouth off and say nonsense you might pretend not to know this man you might claim to get amnesia about this man but you know that this is a trustworthy man, an honest man, who has lived among you for 40 years, and you know him quite well, and so you know that when I tell you that this man doesn't speak out of whim, but also this man has not strayed or erred. There is no mistake here. إن هو إلا وحي يوحى علمه شديد القوى. This what does this refer to? What this man says is but a revelation. وحي يوحى a revelation that is being revealed. Taught to him. By Shadid al Qawwa, by someone of great dominion and great power. Allama al Shadid al Qawwa, is it here referring to Allah or referring to the angel Gibril? In my opinion, it's referring to Allah. Allama al Shadid al Qawwa. Shadid al Qawwa. Gabriel is, of course, an angel with overwhelming power. Um, but Gabriel is but an agent, a messenger. Gabriel doesn't do any of the original thinking himself. It is all from Allah. Gabriel just simply communicates what Allah says. Okay, so that gets everyone's attention. There is a falling star which normally is something that you take as an ill omen. But instead, if, so if you're going to start out the surah by talking about a falling star, what you expect is is that the surah is going to say, by the falling star, you're all going to hell, for instance. Or by the falling star, the unbelievers are horrible people. But instead, it says, by the falling star, this man is truthful. 
This gets everyone's attention. Because it immediately puts you on notice that there is something coming, or what they call Jawab al-Qasam, is going to be Zumiratin Fastawa Wahua bil Ufukil Ala Thumma Dana Fatadella Fakana Kaba Kawsaini Aw Adna Fauha Ila Abdihi Ma Auha. The language here is unbelievably beautiful. It's mind blowing language. It is said there are reports that say that Surah Al-Najm was the first surah that the Prophet ﷺ recited publicly in Mecca. Now, of course, again, we get into the historical problem because if, it, if it's the first surah recited publicly in Mecca, then it can't be revealed in the fifth year. And it can't be a late Meccan revelation. So that's why I don't put a lot of weight on, on these reports that this is the first surah recited publicly in Mecca. But I think that the reciting of Surah Al Najm in Mecca was such an event that a lot of people th be believed it was the first surah recited in Mecca. And it was such an event because it got everyone's attention. The language of the surah got people's attention. Dhu mirratin fastawa Al-Mirra, which, uh, verse the translation so I don't confuse people. This is uh, verse 6. Zu Mirratin Fastawa, study Quran says, possessed of vigor, he stood upright. Um, Mirra, could mean someone that has a very good intellect, khasaba akliya as they say. It could mean that someone who has a great deal of rationality and is very dignified. Um, and it could mean also someone who is very beautiful. And it comes from the word Mara. And Al Maru are is the the threads of the rope of a rope. So from the, the threads that form, the threads as they, as they weave together to form a robe, a strong robe, that's what word, the word mirror came from, originated from. But it came to be used to mean someone of sound intellect or a beautiful intellect or beautiful physical appearance. So here, the surah, again, doesn't tell us who is it that istawa means someone with mirra, someone with this perfection of rationality and appearance, and istawa, the study of Quran translates it as stood upright, but istawa could just like settled in a, in a, in a correct way, in, in a completely authoritative way. So when we say istawa ala al arsh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala istawa al arsh, it means not that Allah stood upright on the throne, but it means that Allah settled on a throne in a completely authoritative way. So,
possessed of great intellect and beauty, settled authoritatively, وَهُوَ بِالْأُفُقِ الْأَعْلَى And he was up high. بِالْأُفُقِ الْأَعْلَى The study Quran translates it as uh, the highest horizon. But بِالْأُفُقِ الْأَعْلَى means high in the atmosphere, in the, in the, in the skies. ثُمَّ دَنَا فَتَدَلَّى Then he came close and even drew closer. And at that point, well, then until فَكَانَ قَابَ قَوْسَيْنِ أَوْ أَدْنَى At that point, that object of description has become very close, mere feet, out, feet away. And at that point, فَأَوْحَى إِلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ مَا أَوْحَى And at that point, then he revealed to his servant what he revealed. So the image that has been constructed in your mind, someone who's been taught by only the most monumental power, and that And then it tells you that that with perfection or with with great sound reason settled authoritatively in a place doesn't tell you exactly where other that it's not in your world it's up in the horizon or up in the heavens up in the skies and that they drew very close until they were mere feet away. And at that point, God reveals what God reveals. So of course, there is a big question that it leaves in your mind, who is it talking about? Islamic sources have a long discussion as to who is it that was of great power and, and, and settled on the horizon and drew closer. Is it talking about Gibril? And is it talking about the Prophet and Gabriel meeting and coming very close to one another? And then Allah revealing to the Prophet through Gabriel, or is it talking about, so is it Gabriel and the Prophet, or is it talking about God and the Prophet? Why do they have this, this this long discussion? Well, for several reasons. Islamic sources say that the Prophet ﷺ saw Gabriel in his true form twice in his life. Once in the heavens and once on earth. Gabriel would normally appear to the Prophet not in his true angelic form because that's beyond the senses, the ability of human beings to withstand. But, the, but there are reports that say that the Prophet saw Gabriel twice. One of those times is in the Isra' al-Mi'raj. 
Now, there are fascinating reports about whether the Prophet ﷺ saw God, God's self. And what makes these traditions fascinating is that the Prophet reportedly is asked several times whether during the Isra and Ma'raj whether he saw God. And reportedly the Prophet says, what I saw was light. No one can see God in God's true image. But what the Prophet says is what I saw is light. In one report, it's light. I saw a river, and after the river, I saw a light. In another report, I saw light. There are traditions that go back to Aisha, the Prophet's wife, in which Aisha says that anyone that anyone who says that the Prophet saw God in any form is mistaken. That the Prophet saw Gibril and heard God but didn't see God or see an image of God whether it's light or otherwise. And then there's long discussions about these reports and you know the usual scholarly debate that goes on about what Aisha said and what Abu Huraira said and what Ali said and what Osman said and it's a long um, uh, long protracted story. However, as we will see, I don't think it really matters what Surah to Najm is portraying to us, if you understand what the purpose of Surah to Najm is, you understand why it doesn't really matter. What it is contrasting is a Najm is a Hawa, the falling star, and the, the ascension of the prophet and the illuminations that the prophet undergoes in that ascension. But even that ascension is to teach us a point. So as the prophet The, the critical point is that the Prophet ascends and that the Prophet draws close and that the Prophet had the closeness through which the, by which the Prophet draws, the Prophet then reveals a revelation, a sure thing, a truthful thing, a solid thing as we will see. So, until Allah reveals to his servant what Allah reveals, and the comment about this is, مَا كَذَّبَ الْفُؤَادُ وَمَا رَأَى أَفَتُمَارُونَهُ عَلَى مَا يَرَى وَلَقَدْ رَآهُ نَزْلَةً أُخْرَى عِنْدَ سِدْرَةِ الْمُنْتَهَى عِنْدَهَا جَنَّةُ الْمَأْوَى إِذْ يَغْشَى السِّدْرَةَ مَا يَغْشَى So, وَمَا كَذَّبَ الْفُؤَادُ وَمَا رَأَى The heart did not lie. Now some rely, point to this and say, see, this means that the ascension of the Prophet ﷺ was not necessarily physical, but it was by the heart. 
I don't think it makes a difference, and I'll tell you why in a second. The heart did not lie as to what it saw. And how can you possibly dispute with him what he in fact says he saw? Because indeed, he saw him Uh, where was I? Oh. Uh, uh, so, because, and indeed, he saw him truly again in the Sidrat al I'll explain Sidrat al in, a, in an instant, but. Okay. 17, it says, وَمَا زَاغَ الْبَصَرُ وَمَا طَغَى At 17, it tells you, so the, the gaze or the eyes, وَمَا زَاغَ الْبَصَرُ So the eyes did not, um, they translated in the Quran, the gaze swerved not, nor did it transgress. وَمَا زَاغَ الْبَصَرُ وَمَا طَغَى means like, um, when I tell, it's like saying, what you saw was true, not false. That's what Mazaga. So you know that at one time it tells us that the heart did not see the wrong thing, but then it tells us that the eyes didn't see the wrong thing. So those who want to say that the Prophet ascended spiritually always refer to oh the heart. And those who want to say that the Prophet ascended physically always say, see, it says eyes. Listen, it is because we think of ascension as the way a rocket ascends in the heavens or a shuttle goes up in the uh, atmosphere. We forget that our entire universe is made of dimensions. And you, we forget that you don't need to go from one reality to another to actually ascend in the, in the skies for X number of hours or X number of years or whatever. So when we talk about the ascension of the Prophet ﷺ, physically or spiritually, it's not a matter of, it's not like us going to the moon or us sending a shuttle to Mars. It, the, the, that level of reality, you're talking about the bending of time and space and dimensions. And that can be done in an instant. And a body that is but absent for a part of a second in our world in a different world could be absent for a full year. It, it just requires a little bit of imagination and understanding of maybe just... Uh, and uh, interestingly, not the imaginations of science fiction writers, but of physicists. Um, and the, the things they write about dimensions and time travel and space travel and all this very interesting stuff. Anyway, okay. So, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then is telling us that the heart did not err and the eyes did not err. What is it that the Prophet saw? Well, on the one hand, Surah al Najm definitely communicates that what the Prophet ﷺ saw is the truth. And what the Prophet saw is something monumental. But 
it maintains a level of ambiguity. So when it talks about Sidrat al-Muntaha, let's see how they translated this. Uh, yeah, they translated it as um, the Garden of the Refuge. Um, What the Quran it say that at Sidrat al Muntaha and Daha Jannat al Ma'wa that at this point of Sidrat al Muntaha there is Jannat al Ma'wa, there is the heavens. But what is Sidrat al Muntaha? Anyone that tells you it's a speculation. In other words, it's at the a point at the heavens. They say that this is the point where all the records of deeds are kept in the heavens. Some say it's in the sixth heaven. Some say it's a seventh heaven. Who knows? Some say that this is where the martyrs go after they're martyred. Some say that this is... It, it, at Sidrat al-Muntaha is a beautiful tree with leaves that are huge like the ears of an elephant. I mean, you read these all the materials in reports. And, and so on. And you read things about how there are at Sidrat al-Muntaha um, birds that look like gold that fly around. But all of these reports are unreliable. All of them were told by Qassas. All of them, the names of Qassas feature very prominently. Sidrat al-Muntaha is a point in the heavens that Allah tells us is of great significance because Jannat al-Ma'wa, Jannat al-Ma'wa is, he is heaven of reward or the heaven of it is located. But we have no frame of reference for it other than to say that it's beyond our reality. So the Prophet ﷺ was taken beyond your reality and what he saw, he did see for sure and you have a choice. Are you going to believe or you are you not going to believe? وَلَقَدْ رَأَى مِنْ آيَاتِ رَبِّهِ الْكُبْرَى and Allah completes this section by saying, and this is one of the great ayat, one of the great signs or manifestations of your Lord. So this is the opening salvo of Surah Al-Najm. A falling star, a prophet traveling in a reality that we're not aware of, in the heavens, in certitude, with the language connoting a remarkable nearness to divinity. Something that is solid and something that is sure. And that there is no falsehood and no trickery. And that this is among the great manifestations of the divine. At this point, now we are at verse 19. 20 does a 180 turns very suddenly and starts 
talking about a very different reality. أَفَرَأَيْتُمُ اللَّاتَ وَالْعُزَّةَ Have you seen this Lat and this Al-Uzza? ومنات الثالثة الأخرى and منات the third, this other. ألكم الذكر وله الأنثى تلك إذا قسمة ضيضة إن هي إلا أسماء سميتموها أنتم وآباؤكم ما أنزل الله بها من سلطان إن يتبعون إلا الظن وما تهوى الأنفس ولقد جاءهم من ربهم الهدى أم للإنسان أم للإنسان ما تمنى فلله الآخرة والأولى So have you seen Allat and Al-Uzza and Manat, this other? Do you think that unto you are the males and unto God are the females? Qismatun Dida, this would be, Dida is not just an unfair division, but a very, like saying this would be, very, and this would be truly an odd arrangement. But then it tells us, but these are but names that you've named, you and your fathers. They have no reality. Ma anzal Allahu biha min sultan, that they have no reality in God's world other than what you've given them. They follow not but conjecture and that which their souls desire. Though guidance has surely come to them from their Lord. And then it asks this rhetorical question. Or is it that humans should have whatever they long for? Unto God or to God belongs this world and the hereafter. So if you're paying attention, you'd say, okay, wait, what's going on here? So it's saying, have you considered Manat, Lat, Wal Uzza? These are just names that you've given them. They have no reality beyond what you've given them and is it that should human beings just live according to their whims the clear implication is that Al-Lat and Al-Manat Al-Uzza are products of whimsies or whim or capriciousness. Well, Al-Lat and Manat Al-Uzza were the names that of idols worshipped in Arabia. What's important to know is that these idols were not our typical image of idols. In other words, they were not statues that people would build and worship. But rather, they were like, like um, um, in the case of Manet, it was an idol, it was an actual statue. But in the case of Lat wal Uzza, one of them was a grave site and a shrine built around the grave site. Another was more like um, a tree 
and a structure built around a tree. The tree was purported to be possessed by demons and have demons living in, in, in the tree complex and stuff like that. But anyway. But the important thing is that they are they were not necessarily it's not that these people believed that the tree was a god and they didn't believe that the gravesite was a gravesite for a god and they didn't even necessarily believe that the statue of of manat well they did believe that manat was a goddess but but that what we call idol worship was often a practice of believing in superstition that if you pay x amount of money or if you do certain rituals at certain sites what you will get is good luck and good fortune it had nothing to do with the hereafter it had nothing to do with accountability it had nothing to do with morals it was all about the here and now and about doing things that would move the forces of the cosmos to maximize your chances of success in the here and now. Now this is a really important point. Because we are not necessarily talking about God worship. We are talking about systems of belief and superstition and psychology. What these people wanted was success in this world. They wanted success in their commerce. They wanted success in their marriages. They wanted success with their children. They wanted success with when they bought a house, when they farmed land, when they whatever they did. And they believed that they should do whatever maximizes their chances of success. And if it meant spending a little money at the sites of good luck and good fortune, so be it. It was not about a God-centered religion or a, a religion centered on gods. And part of the frivolity of this was a loose belief that if there are angels and these people in the desert would often see things that they would describe as jinn. See, so see supernatural events, paranormal things, or things he couldn't explain. And they were scared of jinn. They were terrified of, of what jinn could do to them. And they were often a lot of the things they did at the shrines were to seek protection from jinn. But when it came to angels, they didn't know what to do about angels. But there was a loose belief, especially in Mecca, not necessarily outside of Mecca, but especially in Mecca, that angels must be the sexy daughters of God. And often, in poetry, these daughters would be described in very voluptuous terms. They're always naked, 
or wearing transparent stuff and they're always running around giggling and bathing and laughing. So it was a form of eroticizing the divine as if the divine was simply just keeping a harem of daughters. And the Quran is stripping away at these various systems of belief and says, so you th if, if God is, has, has offspring, God is going to just create daughters for erotic imagery? What's wrong with you? That's what Fakli of Quran is saying. What's wrong with you? When it says Tilka isn't Kusmatun Diza, like this is this is an absurd division because of the implication that God only has female daughters to maintain an erotic type of harem. But of course, we know that the Quran rejects God having offspring, period. Now, but when the Quran says Is it that human beings are entitled to just get their whim? It makes you pause and say, So, what, it, what is it? explicitly referencing here. These idols, Allat wa Manat wa Uzza, and as we will see in a second, the fourth idol, the Shara, is inside of all human beings. Manat Manat is often um, re represents the desire to live as long as possible and to escape death. Al Uzza represents the love of Izz. Izz is prestige and power. And in that represents hub and that was shahwa, was shahwat. It represents the love of uh, pleasure and desire. So, or take them in, 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 in different order. So, the, the desire to indulge, that's a let, in, indulge in, 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 in as much fun as possible. al uzza the desire for prestige and power. And manat is the desire to live the many al-baqa wa kurh and maut is the desire to live as long as possible and to, to hold on to this earth as if it is the only reality. Now remember these three, because we're going to add the fourth, a shara, which the, the Surah al will come to. So, if you understand this, then you understand why Allah says, 
Is it that human beings are entitled to their whims? There are people who live for their whims. And as Surah Al-Najm is leading us to down the pasture of life choices. And the world of Ashbah, the world of shadows, Wa'alam al-Arwah, and the world of souls and spirits. What do you want to construct for yourself and for your others and for others? Let's pray Maghrib and come back. So just so um, in Arabic the, the, the parallels are alert is hub is that was shahawat wal uzza is hub al uzza wa jah wa riyasa wa manat at tamanni al liqa wa karahiyat at tamanni al biqa al baqa wa karahiyat liqa illa Okay, so we said that we explained why the Quran comments about um, is it that unto you are the males or unto God are the females um, commenting ex precisely on some of the conceptualizations of Quraysh. And as we said, then the reference in Surah Al-Najm to, to are human beings entitled to the products of their whims and then وَكَمْ مِنْ مَلَكٍ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَفِي السَّمَاوَاتِ لَا تُغْنِي شَفَاعَتُهُمْ شَيْئًا إِلَّا مِنْ بَعْدْ أَنْ يَأْذِنُ اللَّهُ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَرْضَى This, this is um, uh, 26, yeah. And how many an angel is there in heavens whose intercessions avails not save what God grants leave unto whomsoever God wills and unto the one with whom God is content. As we'll see, th this will turn out to have some significance. I mean, uh, the meaning is obvious that you're not going to get the intercession of angels or anyone else unless God wills. Uh, but we'll, we'll see why this will turn out to actually be an interesting reference in Surah Al-Najm um, in a second. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْآخِرَةِ لَيُسَمَّوْنَ الْمَلَائِكَةَ تَسْمِيَةَ الْأُنْثَى That those, the, the unbelievers give angels uh, women's names and we, we've talked about that. And then the, the the, the uh, Allah comments on this ما لهم به من علم إيا تبعون إلا الظن وإن الظن لا يغني من الحق شيئا so this is now 28 which is they have no knowledge of this they follow not but conjecture and surely conjecture avails not against the truth. Now, interestingly, this Quranic expression, "Inna dhanna la yughni min al haqi shay'a," um, the impact of that Quranic expression far transcended this context. It actually became a maxim in law, and that if certitude is established conjecture or probability of belief is not 
enough to overcome certitude. This became a principle of law, this became a principle of justice. It has had a profound impact on the institutions of justice in the Islamic civilizations, especially on Sharia. And um, it also became an ethical principle that when there are primordial truths which include ethical principles, and these ethical principles cannot be overcome by a probability of belief and conge or conjecture. Where that becomes particularly important, interestingly enough, is in politics. That if you have, for instance, belief in the sanctity of life, and you believe that uh, that if you take certain convenient um, uh, shortcuts uh, that will for sure lead to the loss of life, but because you believe conjecturally that you are going to send you're going to end up saving more life in the long term, you're not speculation cannot be used to overcome primordial principles of ethics. So the, the prime example of this is our people in a boat and they think, well, maybe if we throw someone, one of us overboard, the boat will be lighter and we will have a better chance of surviving. Islamic law says that's conjecture. Uh, what you know for sure is the sanctity of human life, is that you're not allowed to kill anyone. That you know for sure, for certitude. But you're guessing that maybe if we kill one of us, the rest of us will have a better chance of survival. And these are the types of, so it's, I mean, it's interesting that you have these Quranic uh, principles that are often uttered in, um, in various contexts that end up having a profound cultural impact in the Islamic civilization. In the modern age, of course, I, you know, one wishes that Muslims would remember these ethical principles again, because um, authoritarianism and despotism is built on conjectural belief that you know, it, we should jail people just so in case uh, they might destabilize, they, they, just in case that may, may destabilize society, or we should oppress people just in case that they, uh, it might lead to wrong ideas, or, you know, but if so much of the Quran goes against the grain of that, if only Muslims would remember their own tradition. Okay, in the Zonna la yuhni an al min al haqqi shay shay a the conjecture cannot overcome truth or certitude. Farid an man tawalla, farid an man tawalla an zikrina, wa lam yurid illa al hayat al dunya. Zalika mablaghum min al ilm in rabbaka hu alam. بمن ضل عن سبيله وهو أعلم بمن اهتدى. So at this point, this is now twenty nine and thirty. So turn away and note here how expansive this is. Turn away. from those who are focused, sorry, turn away from those who are themselves turned away from our remembrance, and zikrina. Turn away from those who do not our, want our zikr. They don't want to remember us. And and what and turn away from those 
who want nothing but life on this earth. ذَلِكَ مَبْلَغُهُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ Another phrase that had an enormous impact on the Islamic civilization. This is the extent of their knowledge. It's like saying, listen, you look at this world. Now, start, think, start putting the surah together. There is... The star that descends, that crumbles, that falls, the falling star. There's the prophet that ascends, ascends to the nearness of the divine, to certitude. Now, with that prophet that ascends, who has this incredible experience, of knowing or seeing that experiencing the divine in ways contrast that to these things Allah wal Uzza and Manat and Allah wal Uzza and Manat these basic these base desires desire of power desire of prestige desire of um, ego desire uh, desire to, for for pleasures um, what this is then bolstered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking to the prophet and through the prophet to believers and says there are people you are surrounded by people who know nothing better. The, the, this is the extent of their knowledge. This is what they know. What they know is Allah wal Uzza and Manat. And what they know is this world, they have, they have no conception of a reality, of the, an ascendant reality, a reality of certitude, the certitudes of the divine. And all they can think of is their life on this earth. And all they want is life on this earth. They have no patience for our dhikr. Their connection to the divine is weak, if not existent. And remember, that through your experience, you have a certitude of the divine. These people live with conjecture. What is the conjecture? The conjecture is their own whims. I feel, I want, so I take. Now, here, Muslim scholars often talk about, in the same context of Alam al-Arwah wa Alam al-Ashbah, the world of shadows and the world of souls, that there are khawatir nafsaniya and khawatir qalbiya. Instincts, what, what, you, what you tell yourself, khawatir nafsaniya are the impulses that come from nothing more than base feelings. What makes me feel good, what doesn't make me feel good. What, in, what we call often utility. Al-Khawatir al-Qalbiya are themselves reactions to a different type of feelings. These are feelings of primordial truth. So what love of a mother to her child or khawatir qalbiya, not nafsaniya. It is ingrained in a truth. Your desire for 
companionship is khawatir qalbiya, not khawatir nafsaniya. Because Allah created people in azwaj litaskunu ilayha. Your conscience telling you you should seek knowledge that's khawatir qalbiya not nafs not nafsaniya your conscience telling you you should go up, you should get up and pray and remember god and be grateful that's khawatir qalbiya not nafsaniya your conscience telling you take care of your neighbor and don't betray your neighbor don't betray your friend don't backbite your friend is khawatir qalbiya, not khawatir nafsaniya. Are emotions a product of an ethical principle or are they amoral? Emotions, feelings that don't have a morality. That's the main distinction between khawatir qalbiya and khawatir nafsaniya. When they are amoral, they're nafsaniya. When they are founded in morality, there are Qalbiya. So, when the Quran asks that question, are people entitled to their whims? What Muslim scholars would respond at that point and say, people are entitled to their khawatir Qalbiya their feelings based in morality, but their khawatir nafsaniya are very dangerous because it produces shadows. It keeps human beings in the realm of shadows. I'll give you a scary thought, but this is sort of like I'm jumping from a very different realm, from a very different world. Some scholars said that if you lived in the world in shadows in your life, when you die, you might be punished by getting stuck in the world of shadows after death. Spooky. You know, if you ever seen shadow a ghost, like shadow man, um, that it's not, you know, you don't want to be stuck as a shadow after death. Um, anyway, from a different field. Okay. And remember, لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ لِيُزْدَ الَّذِينَ أَسَاءُوا بِمَا عَمَلُوا بِمَا عَمِلُوا وَيُجْدَ الَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُوا بِالْحُسْنَى And a very basic principle. Allah maintains control of the heavens and the earth. But Allah gives you a very interesting follow-up to that. This is uh, 31. Unto God belongs whatever is in the heavens and earth. What is the follow-up? So that God, so that God may give those who've done bad their just deserve and those who have done good Al Husna bil Husna means literally who've done beauty with beauty. So it's as if God is saying, I maintain control for the scales of justice. Okay. And then at this point in Surah Al Najm comes a statement that will take a lot of thought and writing and الَّذِينَ يَشْتَنِبُونَ كَبَائِرَ الْإِثْمِ وَالْفَوَاحِشَ إِلَّا اللَّمَمْ 
إن ربك واسع المغفرة وهو أعلم بكم إذ أنشأكم من الأرض وإذ أنتم أجنة في بطون أمهاتكم فلا تزكوا أنفسكم هو أعلم بمن تقى So those who avoid al ism wal fawahish those who avoid ism are sins fawahish are um graver sins there are indecent sins, indecencies. Save a lemon, and we'll talk about what a lemon means in a second. For God is most forgiving, God is vast in forgiveness, and God knows you best, okay, and do not, وَلَا تُزَكُّ أَنفُسَكُمْ a remarkable expression. Do not commend yourself. Do not commend yourself because God is the one who knows who is truly pious. Okay, let's unpack this step by step. So, first, avoid grave sins, avoid sins, and grave, and, and avoid indecencies. إِلَّا lemon. But what is lemon? Lemon, linguistically, is whatever can, is scattered and can be ignored. In context, There is several, there, there are several schools of thought, if you will. Some said a lemma means whatever you've done in the past, but you have repented and do no more. So a lemma is what is distant in your past, but you've repented and do not do anymore. Others said a lemon are minor infractions that do not impeach your moral credibility as a human being, but that are a product of your weakness. But they're minor infractions, they're not the major sins. They're not like not praying or not fasting or fornication or adultery or so on. Others said a lemon are things that are not haram and not a wajib, not forbidden or required, but things that are makruh or mustahab, things are favored or disfavored. So if you do what God has not forbidden, but what God has disfavored, but you stick to the to the big items, like you, you stick to haram and halal, but that there is a good chance that God will forgive you. In my view, and it's a view of, of, of many, by the way, that alamam are the... the um, Lemam are anything other than the major sins, the major sins that a kabair, which is like not praying or not fasting or murder or um, adultery or fornication, these are all kabair, these are major sins. But our lemam are sins that you fall into occasionally but that when you remember, you repent from. 
if you stubbornly insist on committing the same sin again and again and again, then it can no longer be considered a lemma. So, a lemma would mean what you fall into inadvertently or because of occasional weakness but you do your best to fix. Okay. Now, why... A lot of minds is that I know you're weak. I've, I've created you from the time that you were embryos. And so I know your nature. And I know who you are. But... Allah gives us a remarkable insight into what causes people to either become in the camp of al-fawahish, al-ithm al-fawahish, or in the camp of lemon. And that is your attitude towards yourself. وَلَا تُزَكُّ أَنفُسَكُمْ تُزَكُّ أَنفُسَكُمْ literally means where you say to yourself, I'm good, I'm good enough, I'm, I'm fine. Or, I am a very good Muslim. Or, I am a knowledgeable person. Or, I'm more knowledgeable than most Muslims, so I'm fine. Or, I look at other Muslims and I see the sins they do, and man, compared to them, I'm much better, so I'm fine. All of that is the scared of nafs. And that attitude will take you from the realm of a lemon to the realm of fawahish al -Islam. Because you're committing the gravest sins of all, sin of all. You're taking God for granted. And Moreover, as we'll see, you're making your God your whim, your hawa. And right away, وَأَعْطَى قَلِيلًا أَفَرْأَيْتَ الَّذِي تَوَلَّى وَأَعْطَى قَلِيلًا وَأَكْدَى now, أَرَأَيْتَ الَّذِي تَوَلَّى Did you see that who has turned away and has given little Wa'akda means, but didn't come through. Akda means that you've given, but be, then you've thought to yourself, I've given, and I've given enough. So I'm not going to continue giving. What is the relation of this to la tuzakku anfusakum? It's the same thing. You think of yourself as doing a favor. Now, they tell you in the traditions that this was meant, this verse was addressing in Walid ibn al Mughira that there are conflicting narratives, but basically, one is that in Walid ibn al Mughira at one point listens to the Quran and starts getting affected by it and converts to Islam, and then when he is confronted by his people and say, you know, did you convert? And, and say, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll give you, uh, we'll give you money uh, if you come back to, if you leave Islam, and he does. Um, there are many, you know, it's, it's whether this event happened or not, um, it doesn't fit as an occasion for revelation anyway. Another story says that in Walid ibn al-Mughira himself went to someone who had converted to Islam and he said, I'll take your sins, don't worry, in the hereafter I'll carry your sins and I'll give you money if you leave Islam and the person does leave Islam 
But then after making the first payment on whatever Walid promised this person, Walid didn't pay the rest. And then they say that the, uh, the revelation is that that who gave and then stopped. But that doesn't fit either. Um, what, as many commentators noted, that it is talking about a personality type. The personality type that looks at what they give and thinks it's enough and I'm not going to give anymore. And then for Orientalists, by the way, often say that um, is that not until the Prophet goes to Medina does the Prophet try to tie Islam to the Abrahamic tradition. Well, I mean, here in Surah Al-Najm is a very obvious example to, the, to how that's all nonsense. Because immediately, Surah Al-Najm says, remember, I am giving you principles that I've gave, given Moses and I've given Abraham before you basic foundational principles that were given to previous prophets because it's the same message. What are these principles? No one can may be held responsible for the sins of another. This is one of the basic disagreements with Christianity. Jesus can't suffer for our sins. Only the person who committed the sins can suffer for the sins. And a human being is responsible only for their deeds and not the deeds of another. There is a significance, by the way, for mentioning wa Ibrahim al-Ladi wafa. Ibrahim, this is uh, 37. And Abraham al-Ladi wafa, who was faithful and discharged his obligations towards God. But then right away it tells you that no one can be held accountable for the sins of another. Or no one can be held to pay for the sins of another. The significance of this is Ibrahim's sacrifice is the purported incident when he is willing to kill his own son um, to please God. But وَلَا تَزْرُ وَزِرَ وَزْرَ أُخْرَ immediately after that, it's God saying, if anything, this incident was to teach human beings that the principle of sacrifice of one for another is, no, is, is invalid. And this is something that modern Muslims need to learn that in fact the whole narrative of Abraham and his son was not with the main print the main purpose of that narrative was for God to tell Abraham no that's not the way we do things anymore okay and that a human being is only responsible for what they've done and that a human being's actions will in fact be seen by their Lord. This is 40. The study Quran says, and his endeavoring shall be seen, which is fine. Um, okay. وَأَنَّ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ الْمُنْتَهَىٰ And to God, 
is the return uh, وأنه هو أضحك وأضحك وأبكى وأنه هو أمات وأحيا وأنه خلق الزوجين الذكر والأنثى من نطفة إذا تمنى وأن عليه النشأة الأخرى وإن وأنه هو أغنى وأقنى أوكي وأنه هو رب الشعر Okay, so this is all the way to 49. So, that it is God adhaka wa abka. You might think, well, wait, causes laughter and weeping? What is this about? Very interestingly, it is only human beings that laugh and cry. Allah, not all commentators notice this, actually quite, very few of them, but some did, that Allah is reminding you that, that it's quite miraculous. Only human beings are capable of laughing and crying. And that this is the God who causes death and life. And this is the God that created male and female. And the God who will cause the second genesis or the resurrection. وَأَغْنَى وَأَقْنَى Aghna means that who gives riches. Aqna, that who also gives a sense of security with riches. So, you could be given a home, but to feel that, to feel that safe in your home, is a separate blessing. There are many people who can be given shelter, but they don't feel that this is a real home. It's a blessing when Allah allows you to feel sheltered, safe, and secure. وَأَنَّهُ هُوَ رَبُّ الشَّارَةِ And at this point, Allah tells you, and this is the God of Shara. This is 49. The study Quran translates it as the God of Cyrus. The reason the study Quran translates it as the God of Cyrus is that Shara was one of the stars in Cyrus, the star that some Arabs worshipped. But there is another, the, the, in Arabic, a poet is called the Sha'r. Poetry is called Sha'r. Why? Because Cyrus, as a star, was also thought to be um, the embodiment of whimsy. And here, if you put put it all together, and let وَالْعُزَّةَ وَمَنَاتْ وَالشَّعْرَ the, the four main objects of worship. We said in that is حُبِّ الذَّاتِ وَالشَّعْوَ is the desire for pleasure. And an uzda is prestige and power. وَمَنَاتْ is the desire to live and avoidance of death. الشَّعْرَ is literally coveting 
whimsicalness itself. Those whose God, Cyrus, meaning representative of, whose God is whimsicalness, their own whim. And then, as is often a common uh, Quranic style, it reminds you of past nations, powerful nations that have been destroyed by God. And at that point, it asks you a rhetorical question, فَبِأَيِّ آلَاءِ رَبِّكَ تَطَمَارَ This is 55. So if you understand all of this, how can you dispute your Lord and dispute the power and the blessings and the authority of your Lord? This is the same warning that has been sent to human beings again and again, again, Abraham and Moses and Jesus. Azifat al azifah, laysa laha min dun illahi kashifa, afamin, afamin, afaman has al hadisi, afamin has al hadisi tajabun, what of hakuna wala tapkun, wa antum samidun, fasjudu lillahi wa abudu. So, Azifat al azifah, Again, the language is amazing. It's literally like saying, so time is up, or time is running out. لَيْسَ لَهَا مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ كَاشِفَةً You have no recourse but to God. So, you're confused by this? This is confusing you? And when you hear this, you continue laughing, having fun, instead of crying because of the seriousness of the situation? وَأَنْتُمْ سَامِدُونَ You continue laughing with your head held high, meaning you continue being arrogant, haughty, unbroken. So prostrate unto God and worship. According to most schools, this is another point if you're reading the surah in prayer and you come to Fasjudu then you prostrate. There is a sajda. The Malikis say that the sajda is recommended but not required. Just as a sidebar. So let's take, go back again and take the entire surah to Najm now. So the falling star, the ascending prophet, the certitudes of divinity, the shadows of the idols that human beings adopt in all of us is Allah wal Uzza wa Manat wa Shara. It's in all of us. We worship desire, we worship prestige, we worship ego, we worship zealousy, we worship all types of things. But Allah consistently reminds us in this powerful format that the crux of the matter is that tuzakku and fusakku, that you decide you're good enough. You clean or you declare yourself sufficiently pure 
or sufficiently pious or sufficiently knowledge knowledgeable and that you forget the remarkable synchronicity of creation itself and at the end is that you distract yourself with Antum Samidun, that you, you sort of keep your, that, that image of people who have their head held high and laughing, meaning they distract themselves from the message instead of listening because it makes them worry or anxious or concerned, they distract themselves. They joke around. They, they fool around. There is a narrative, again, one of these, that there was a Yemeni tribe that whenever they listened to hear the Quran, they would try, try to distract themselves by singing. In other words, they didn't want to hear the Quran because it didn't make them feel good, so they would start singing. And that that was, but again, it's, you know, it's probably a historical event, but an occasion for revelation, I doubt. But it, it applies, and that's why probably the commentators mention it. So at this point, now I ask you, who or what is the star that is falling? Because here's the scary thing. The star that is falling might be you. This is the absolute twist of Surat al -Najm. Are you the fallen star? Or are you going to ascend with the Prophet? With the subtext that most of us, unfortunately, are fallen stars. The, the world of shadows. In Sufi-esque sources, they say that in order that among the lessons of Surat al-Najm, that in order to ascend so that you will be like the Prophet Adna, that you will be as near to the Divine as the Prophet was requires four basic steps. They write a lot about this, but I thought I'd just give you the gist of it so you know what your tradition has. Four steps are, one, tazkiyatul nafs. And tazkiyatul nafs, they say, al-nuhud lil-amal salih Tazkiyatul nafs is purifying the self. But in order to purify the self, you need to perform good deeds. Not theory, not prayer, but good deeds. Two, tasfiyatul qalb, to purify the heart. And in order to purify the heart, you must actively fight in yourself the love of leadership and the love of supremacy and superiority and envy. Three, tazkiyat or purifying the spirit. And in order to purify the spirit, You need long dhikr and long ibadah and sincere worship. And for what they call tazkiyatu sir. And tazkiyatu sir means, I, there's no way to, to translate it other than say the purifying the secret if you will. 
And what that means is you elevate to the realm of embodying the divine qualities of beauty. التحليه بالصفات الإلهية والأخلاق الربانية. So you go in four stages, purifying the self, purifying the heart, purifying the spirit, and eventually and ultimately purification of the secret. For Sufi-esque sources, of course, in order to do this, you need a sheikh. In non-Sufi-esque sources, to do this is possible without a sheikh. That's one of the main uh, points of disagreement between Sufis and non-Sufis, as you probably know. Okay, one final thing before we end. Surat al-Najm, as I mentioned, was an occasion where the purported claimed incident of the satanic verses takes place. And what this is about is that when it comes to the, where it says, that when it mentions an alat wal uzza wa manat, which were supposed to be these sites of worship for, pre, uh, for the uh, pre-Islamic Arabs, that Shaitan, Satan comes and inspires the Prophet to say, That these are the exalted, um, Al Gharaniq is literally like exalted um, symbols, if you will, exalted, exalted items whose intercession is to be desired. And according to the satanic verses incident is that when the kuffar of Mecca hear this, they're very happy because now the Prophet has praised Allah al Uzza wa Manat has praised their, their practices. And they According to some reports, they are so happy that they even do sujood with the Prophet. And they do sujood with Muslims. And then Gabriel comes to the Prophet and says, What is it that you said? He says, well, You know, I said, Tilka al ula, inna shafa'atum turtaja. So Gabriel said, I didn't, this was not part of the divine inspiration, this was not a part of the wah. This was from Shaitan. And then the Prophet goes back and says, no, this was from Shaitan. This is abrogated. Now, what became known, of course, as the Satanic Verses in, in the West, was made famous by Salman Rushdie's novel, um, if you open up a lot of tafsir, they don't even mention the incident. Um, so, I mean, some tafsir do, some don't. A lot of tafsir mention it, and they'll tell you it's not based on anything. It's, it's complete, a complete fabrication. But the story of Al-Gharaniq, or the Satanic Verses, is problematic just if you... Surah Al-Najm itself, the, the entire surah is a condemnation of it's the ascension of the prophet and a condemnation of everything that is worshipped other than God and a condemnation of intercession of anything. And the, it is human beings are only responsible for their deeds. You're, so for the satanic verses to be believed, we'd have to accept that the Prophet said something like, that basically praised 
these idols, but didn't notice that this is against the meaning of the entire surah. So basically then the Prophet would be reciting Surah Al-Najm oblivious to the meaning of Surah Al-Najm. But second, that the Satanic Verses incident is supposed to make us believe that all these people who had followed the Prophet up to this point because of the strict monotheism of Islam had no problem with the Prophet telling them that, oh, and by the way, you know these idols that you've left, their intercession is good, which is exactly against the entire Islamic message. So that's another level of impossibility. But third, there's another problem with the Satanic verses, another problem with the Gharanik story. All the narrators who said that this happened were people who converted to Islam in Medina. None of the people who were alive, who were Muslim at the time of the Prophet, like Omar ibn in Mecca, like Abu Bakr or Omar or Ali, narrated the story. So is it possible that those who actually lived with the Prophet in Mecca during this era failed to mention the story and only later Muslims who most converted after Mecca was defeated are the ones who suddenly are narrating the story? The reason I mention this is because, in the, in, unfortunately, in the West, my former friend, late friend, who pa he passed away, a former friend and a guy who used to have a good head on his shoulders, but like a lot of Muslims lost it under the weight of Orientalism. May Allah forgive him. Wrote a book called The Satanic Verses. And in that book, he traces every, every, every narration, and the conclusion of the book is that early Muslims accepted the satanic verses as historical, but late Muslims did a little bit of historical engineering, and they rejected the satanic verses as historical, and he concludes that it was probably historical, that it probably happened. His name is Shahab Ahmad, and his book is the Satanic Verse. It was published after he died. And I wish it was not published, to be honest with you. Because, quite simply, if you read the book and see what Shahab counted as part, as qualifying, as, as a narration supportive of the Satanic Verses incident, you'll find that he defined it so widely that all types of reports that never mention Illat or Al-Uzza or Manat or all types of reports that ever, never even mention the word Gharaniq and never mention the whole notion of the Quraysh doing sujood with the Prophet and are all counted Although not the, you know, all these indicia are not mentioned, he counts, still counts them as part of the satanic verses because he defines as a narration relating to the satanic verses very widely. The other thing is, of course, a lot of the narrations he himself documents in his books are conflicting and contradictory to each other. And third, he doesn't even address the issue of the historical discrepancy that... It, this narration about the satanic verses pops up in Islamic history long after the death of the Prophet and a lot of the original reports are marfu'ah. They, they actually don't, are not related back to the Prophet. But, we, but he ignores all of that and he comes to this conclusion that it was probably historical and unfortunately a lot of Muslims because of the influence of his book What is Islam? 
mindlessly and ignorantly because you know in, in our age a lot of people like to pretend like they have knowledge that actually have knowledge so in other words they've never read probably a book of hadith in their life but nevertheless went around saying oh yeah he's probably he has a point no he doesn't have a point the satanic verses is an entire invention by late converts to islam who were not sincere converts who and this is not the only tradition, by the way. This is the only one that was made famous by Salman Rushdie. But like many other situations, invented a narrative that questioned the credibility of the Prophet under the guise of being Muslim. That's what the satanic verses are really about. So, the short of it, if you're going to take trust what I'm telling you, or take my say so, ignore the satanic verses incident as an entire nonsense. If you don't trust me, then do the work and read the original sources yourself and spend the next 10 years reading the sources and you'll come to the same conclusion, I assure you. Anyway, alhamdulillah, and that's Surah Al-Nashr. Okay, Bismillah thank you again so much for an incredible Heavy heaviness. Um, anybody have any questions to start us off? Oh, sorry. First question: um, What is the vicar? The entire surah. Entire surah. Okay. Join us. Thank you very much, Sheikh. And it's just a quick one. The um, in terms of the Sufi discourses and the path to ascension, those are the four stages. Mm -hmm you find the self, heart, spirit, and secret. Is that a step-by-step, -step, or is that kind of holistic? Uh, Does one need to be done? Uh, the, the question, the, the, four, the four steps that I mentioned, um, is it step-by-step? -step? It, it's actually, the, these four are diver, divided into, into other steps, I think each, Four, they're divided into three steps or four steps, something, like and they, there is, like a, an order of ascension, but you you pursue the first three, simultaneously, so like like you go, one a one a one a one a two a three a, and then one b two b three b and, and so on. And the the one that I know you don't tackle till much later is the fourth. And I don't think that's divided into uh, many steps. It's just it's one big step. So when sorry, I was a little bit uh, when you said okay. So one a. And you say you perform good deeds, you actively fight in yourself the love of leadership, supremacy, and envy, and then purifying the spirit is long vicar and long ibadah. Yeah, but what I'm saying is that each one is subdivided mm -hmm. into several, into many parts. So, but I didn't go through them because that would take us too long. But I didn't copy them down anyway. So, is it easy to find sources? on that, if we want to know more? Yeah, you can, I mean, it, of course, if, if, if those who access to Arabic, they, they, there are a lot of Sufi treatises written on these, but um, I think there are a few of these Sufi treatises that have been translated to English that talk about this as well. That, so, that, one, that one, the four, is from Koshayri, right, is it? Yeah. Are there yeah, but they're not. I mean, the skill to sir is went well beyond Kushayri. I mean, he mentions that it's mentioned in the context of his tafsir, but in Sufi texts, it's a very common theme. Certain names that you would recommend for people who are not well versed. Did, did was Jilani translated? Yeah, is it? We have it, right? The tafsir? No, the the his, yeah, his, uh, his Sufi text. Yeah, yeah I would. They're I would hard, say Mijulani. They're, they're hard to find. Yeah.
I mean, he's, it, I, these are the ones that were translated into like several volumes, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. No, there's a lot of them. Yeah. And, and Sheikh Nazim as well writes writes about this. Yeah, Sheikh Nazim actually would be a good source as well. I mean, if you're if you're interested in Sheikh Nazim, of course, he, he he within the context of very specific yeah. tariqa, and so he has the word and all of that. Jilani is more um, philosophical, and, and it, you know, it goes into all the the the, the um, you know, yeah, the, the layers of. Anybody else? I forgot who, who was it that published Gilani. It was a very small publisher. Yeah, they're uh, they're not around anymore. I don't remember their name. Yeah. But there's multiple publishers. Okay. Okay, I have a question here. Um, I wonder if the Khawatir Nafsaniya could also refer to when your ego shows itself. If so, are there times when the ego does need to show up for something not connected with a moral cause, save for something like needing your ego for a job interview? Is this a justifiable occurrence of showing your ego? Would it be considered khawatir nafsaniya? If so, each time we do this, are we in fact descending into the world of the shadow? I am generally curious about when our ego does need to be. I mean, of course, I, I don't... I mean, that's an interesting issue. Um, uh, within the context of a job interview, let's say, um, I can see the way I would respond to different questions in a job interview that would involve either khawat al-qadbiya or khawat al-nafsaniya. When I was in law school, I remember uh, I had a job interview where some guy was basically said things that were offensive about Islam and and it was clear he was not it, it, it he wasn't stupid he was actually very smart but he it was clear that he wanted to see if if I'm the, the, the top person was just going to take it and th then he would be more interested in me because he you know didn't want a troublemaker and you know I, I went and filed a complaint against him it was a career office and there was a whole investigation and and of course I didn't get the job but you know um, and I, you know, thinking of other times, like also again interviewing with law firms, where the temptation to respond in a nafsani level, in other words, in an unethical way, is very much there. Um, so I'm, I don't think it's either or. I mean, it's what you do within, um, and what the way you carry yourself. Um, one of the one of the incidents that I, I never forget in my career when uh, when I was in, uh, working in DC, um, um, I had um, a, a legal assistant, a, a secretary that um, basically was being sexually harassed by the rainmaking partner rain-making meaning that that was the partner that brought in most of the business to the law firm. And because he brought in most of the business, he was untouchable. He brought in so much money that kept, you know, all the partners happy. And, uh, you know, the, the, the very strong inclination is to pretend like you're not noticing and when your assistant comes to complain to you to basically say, go talk to the managing partner, don't get me involved. We all know where that comes from. Uh, that's, you know, the desire for job security is a, strong, is a strong one. On the other hand, if you decide to get involved and you testify as to what you've seen and so on, that, so I think life throws 
both at you all the time. Um, all the time. And it's not either or. You know, unless you're going to go work in a strip club or something like that, then I can tell you it's either or. Any questions here? <clears throat> okay. Um, question regarding the angels that are referred to in the verse um, where it says intercession will not avail unless Allah wants. Um, is, uh, is it talking about pious people um, that human beings start worshipping or the angels themselves? No, I mean, the reference is normally taken to... Um, the, the old, there was an old system of belief uh, in spots and places, not, not systematic beliefs in Mecca itself, but in various surrounding areas, that it is possible for angels to, it's possible to appease angels so that angels intercede with God. And you have all these, um, uh, you even have, uh, um, uh, what do you call them, um, Sahara, the, 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 um, um, uh, what's Sahara, um, you know, not magicians, but like um, soothsayers or whatever, that would claim to be in contact with angels from above, origin, depending on their inclination. And uh, then they would, people would pay them so that they would talk to the angels that are in their contact with. So most took, took the verse basically making the principle clear that it is these, these, um, it, the idea that human beings will always seek intercession with the divine has to be has to end um and it was part of the entire jest of the islamic message which the religious practice was so intercession based at the time that islam um, and it was intercession based even in catholicism and judaism and and it, it, islam institutionally fought the the presumption of intercession and that uh, intercession is not something just simply to be presumed or something to be uh, created where there are financial institutions that are built upon the principle of intercession um but malik and fusama more philosophically is that if you look at the heavens, the heavens is replete with forces and beings that we don't understand and we don't see for the most part. Don't preoccupy yourself with communicating with any of them. Communicate with God directly. That's the point. Um, in pre-modernity, there was a people watch the sky very carefully and people kept track of what happens in the heavens all the time and they developed very sophisticated systems of beliefs as to why this appears or that appears or and Islam came and basically said all of that is you, know, you, you should direct your attention towards God and God alone. I'm going to throw one in here because uh, you you talked about this and you kind of moved on you know a lot of i think um modern muslims believe that the story of the sacrifice of abraham's son like the point i, I don't I, I think people believe that like we celebrate the sacrifice right as opposed to the idea that what you said is god is saying we don't do things like that anymore we don't need blood sacrifice so maybe you could say a little bit more about that. Well, we'll come back to it, but I mean, it, it's not, um, we, we celebrate the 
we celebrate the the end of human sacrifices. Um, and and this is, by the way, it's not something unique to, to Islam because it was said that, you know, eventually Christian theologians and Jewish theologians also said the same thing, is that uh, all the monotheistic, all the, the Abrahamic religions um, were dead hostile to the to the practice of human sacrifices that was very widespread in the world. And that if the 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 story of Abraham and the 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 it was a symbolic construct to end or to to say no more human sacrifices anywhere. It's sort of a, a blanket abrogation or a blanket condemnation of human sacrifices. Um, but we'll come back to it in, in Surah Ibrahim. Okay, great. Okay, well, I think on that note, we're going to finish. Thank you very much again for an amazing Tuesday night. And inshallah, we will see you guys on Saturday. Okay. Salaam alaikum.